Well, uh, first, I just want to thank everybody for showing up at the almost the last session of the conference. Appreciate it. Uh, so today we're going to talk about NATS. And uh, so my name is Kevin Hoffman, um, Director of Cloud Engineering at Synadia. Uh, I created a couple of open source projects, uh, co-founded a WebAssembly platform as a service company and uh, just all around nerd, so um, it's pretty much all there is to me. <laughs> um, <laughs> Underselling yourself, Kevin. Yep. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Byron Ruth. Um, I'm a, the VP of Product and Engineering at Synadia. Um, I've been a Nats project maintainer for a handful of years. Uh, I help part of the release team of the Nats server itself, so you might see my name pop up when we're doing releases um, on the Nats server. And then, fun fact: I've prior to joining Synadia, I was actually at uh, a pediatric hospital doing uh, building software for research for uh, nearly 15 years. So, fun little fun little tidbit. And just before we kind of kick things off, um, make sure everyone's paying attention because uh, you might be able to win this uh, jacket if you can answer a, a question at the end of the talk. And then also on your way out, once we're done. Uh, one of our colleagues, Nate, is going to take any little short, you know, couple minute interviews. If you have anything to share about your experience with Nats, um, that would be awesome because um, we like collecting feedback and collecting stories. All right. So typically with these talks, this is a Nats maintainers track talk technically. So um, I wanted to not assume that everyone knows what Nats is. So I'm going to do a super fast walkthrough, uh, try to build up the motivation of what Nats is, why Nats, those types of things. Well, before we go, that the, the, um, just a quick show of hands. How many are yeah. actually familiar with Nats? Yeah, good call. Oh, excellent. All right, so majority. That's cool. What about the who's using Nats in production? All right, fewer. That's cool. That's good. We'll get more of that. Yeah, got um, some work to do. Got some work to do. Yeah. All right. So, dramatic statement. So the reason this is up here, we're at KubeCon, and you know, walking around, um, you see a lot of tech that is layering on abstractions. You know, no diss on any any technology here, but especially with Kubernetes, the rise of Kubernetes, there's a lot of layers and layers and layers upon Kubernetes as one example. It's not just about Kubernetes, but. Nats originated um, back in 2010, and the times were simpler then. <laughs> and you know, being a, a simple messaging bus at the time, it has evolved quite quite a bit. It has a lot more capabilities, which we're going to dig into. And uh, thank you. And so, one of the observations over this time period is that as you know, the industry and the complexity of what you can do keeps increasing. Uh, the sort of Nats Nats based philosophy has remained steady, and you know, keeping th simple things simple, and not trying to add complexity where we don't need it. So, if we sort of look at a you know modern o OSS stack, these are some of the technologies you might see in you know an application architecture, system architecture. None of these are you know individually; they're they're all great technologies, and they're you know they're very popular. Um, but it's one of those things that we step back and we're like, if I'm building a system. That need some of these, you know, basic, let's say, messaging primitives or, or storage primitives or you know, routing, load balancing. You keep, you know, combining all these things together, and you start gaining a lot of complexity out of that. So what's interesting about um, interesting about this is the fact that at a, the very lowest level, we argue that this complexity comes from a couple specific things. So a lot of the foundations when building applications is based on one-to-one -one communication. So we have direct IP, you know, port, and DNS, and you know, HTTP keeps. Thank you, Kevin. I'll pay attention to this. And, and it's gone again. Okay. I'll just have That's to wiggle weird. it while I talk. That'll be fun. Um, <laughs> so it's like it's like doing one of those, right? Um, so. So yeah, so the, the, the idea is that if you had a different foundation of how things can be connected, how things can communicate, 
outside of just a one-to-one -one style model, you can actually get a lot of things for free. You get a lot of benefits. And people will say, yes, that's PubSub, end-to-end -end communication. So we'll get there in a second. The other observation was that, well, if we have this sort of core, core thing, maybe we don't need these load balancers. Maybe we can get by and have a technology that just kind of like does that for us. Another thing is just not necessarily observed at the time and when Nats was created, but certainly in this era where we have larger and larger scale deployments. Single region deployments is, is uh, you know, that still suits a certain set of application, but more and more we want to go multi-region, multi-cloud, you know, distributed out to various edge endpoints and things like that. And then inherently, the more technologies you have to adopt, the more there is to learn, the more that you have to figure out the whole security layer over top, the authentication and authorization layer on top. And that, that's where a lot of this kind of complexity comes from. So, you know, we stepped back and I talked about a couple of these like M2N communication. So NATS has all of these things effectively, like there's some properties of NATS that have this baked in. And sort of as a result of that, as being a single, literally a single binary, single component that you actually have to use and operate and scale, um, it's much simpler to, to, to learn and, and to use and to leverage. And um, the security model is already baked in. Multi-tenancy is already baked in. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a really nice foundation to build uh, up, upon. So, you know, as a one-liner, it focuses on connectivity and communications as its foundation. It has evolved beyond just the message bus. Uh, we do data streaming, and this is why teams love NATS. It sort of suits the developers, it suits the architects, it suits the operators. Uh, operationally, it's very simple to, to manage, and if you look at something like, again, no diss on technologies, but you know, a large Kafka cluster or something like that, because people come to us all the time, they're like, uh, I think this is getting a little too complex. Could Nats solve our problem? So we hear that a lot, and we say, yes, it is quite simpler. Um, so operators really enjoy the technology. Architects, in terms of being able to build you know, the size of cluster they need, the topology of cluster they need to suit their use case. And then developers, all of these basic primitives are built in, and you can just use a single client SDK to kind of get all this stuff out of the box, which is quite nice. So more concretely, just as a, from a project standpoint, and that was a quick whirl, whirlwind, um, we want to get to the, the fun part. Um, again, it's a static uh, Go binary. We support four different operating systems across seven different architectures, so you can kind of run NATS wherever you need to. And then there's 11 official client libraries across all your major programming languages. The community's awesome. So if you're already not on the Slack or you're not you know, subscribed to the newsletter, all those links will be at the end uh, to, to look at. Final quick part of this segment, I'm not gonna read this off, but uh, we did a couple of things uh, this year in 2024 since the last KubeCon North America, and then we have a Nats 2.10 release that's coming up. We're shooting for the end of the year. I know probably many of you who've been following along have been waiting very, very patiently, um, but we have some really good stuff that's, that's coming. All right. So uh, apparently I get to do the, the fun stuff. So um, those of you, uh, most of you said you were familiar with Nats. Uh, has anybody actually heard of Nex? All right, so we got one Nex. person. Early candidate for the shirt. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so one of the things that uh, I love doing is using technologies in a way that uh, they haven't been used before. And one of the things that I uh, started playing with with Nex was what if I can use NATs uh, as the target for distributed computing? So if, in, you know, if I'm building my applications on top of NATs, then I already have this pre-existing NATs infrastructure. I've got NATs servers, I've got leaf nodes, I've got clusters. Why don't I just reuse that or harness all of that infrastructure and use it to deploy uh, applications? So that's essentially what Nets, Next is, the Nats execution engine. So I can store my uh, executables pretty much anywhere, uh, Jetstream, on disk, uh, pull them from OCI repositories or registries, and I can deploy them anywhere I have Nats connectivity. Good. Yeah, sorry, 
I wasn't wiggling enough. Um, and again, same principle as NATS. Uh, there's just a single next, uh, single next binary. So again, the short version is anywhere I have NAT, NATS running, I can now uh, deploy uh, workloads. So one of the big things that I'm trying to, or that we're trying to solve with Nex and uh, Nats in general is the traditional disparity between uh, development and production. Most of the time, what we end up with is uh, sort of a, a faith-based model where I build it locally and I hope it works in production and I find out whether it's going to work in production after I deploy and you know, I've caused a, a big production outage. Another option is I can essentially put all of production on my laptop and sometimes that's uh, useful but it's typically pretty hard to just cram the entire internet into my laptop. Uh, and then we can, <laughs> my wiggling game is off. So the next thing we can do is do uh, simulations where I have a bunch of stuff on my laptop that pretends to be production. And it usually seems like a good idea to start with, but then what I end up doing is testing the mocks and testing the simulators. And I really don't have a good way of proving that what I'm simulating on my laptop is going to behave the same way as it does in production. Again, point-to-point uh, -point communications is usually very difficult to deal with uh, because, again, many of those points that I need to communicate with aren't running on my laptop. And uh, I need service discovery, client-side load balancing libraries. You, you get the idea. We're just adding more complexity. And again, we spend most of the time debugging the environment and not the app. And so with a NATS-based uh, development workflow, uh, if I make some, uh, some key decisions and follow a certain set of patterns, then I can build locally, run it locally, and know that it's going to work in production. Because again, my app is just depending on NATS primitives, and those primitives work the same way on my laptop as they do uh, in a uh, three-region supercluster. Uh, if I rely on NATS to communicate with external services, then uh, when I do mock that communication, uh, then I'm, I have a, uh, a higher guarantee that that's actually going to behave the same way as it does in production, because I'm not messing with you know, HTTP and routers and gateways and firewalls and any of that. It's just a NATS subject. Uh, if I have... Uh, for, well, for at least from my, in my experience, 90% of my data storage needs can be met with uh, NATS primitives like uh, Jetstream streams, uh, key value buckets, and object stores. And uh, sort of the big thing, uh, one of my pet peeves is, and we're probably pretty familiar with this at, at a conference on Kubernetes where the technology is driving our architecture, not the other way around. And I should be able to sit down and design the application that I want and build that application rather than having, you know, this arbitrary combination of 30 vendor products dictate to me how I have to build my app. So one of the other things that Next has is this concept called host services. And again, it just sort of builds on the idea that we're already building applications that use NATS. So if I deploy a JavaScript function to NATS, then uh, there's a suite of host services that gives me access to NATS primitives without me having to do anything. I don't have to make a network connection. And in the case of JavaScript, it's physically impossible. Uh, I don't have to set connection strings. I don't have to worry about secrets. I don't have to worry about any of the things that normally slow me down when I'm trying to develop, uh, when I'm in my development loop. And uh, I'm not sure if this was, uh, whoops. 
Apparently I can't highlight. I can wiggle though, so I guess that's all right. Uh, for JavaScript, we just have this thing where we're, we're injecting an object called host services. And so I can do host services.kv, host services.obj, uh, .messaging. And so all of the things that I can do with NATS, I can do inside my JavaScript function. And uh, there's a, an example of what the command line looks like to run a JavaScript function inside NATS. So I have a small application that I want to show that will highlight uh, sort of the, the general development flow and what it looks like to start applications using Nix. And um, just as a, a note is that the, the version of Nix that I'm going to use for the demo is uh, essentially a future branch. So within the next few weeks or so, you will start seeing release candidates come out of that. And that should eventually make its way to next 1.0. We'll be able to deploy services. And by service, I mean anything that you can run, whether it's a native binary uh, or a Docker image. Uh, we can deploy those from OCI registries. Uh, and uh, one of the applications that I'm running is going to use a NATS uh, micro service. Is it, uh, who here is familiar with the NATS micro framework and standards? and? OK, so short version of that is there's a specific set of subjects and standards that if you follow it, you, uh, then you get service discovery essentially for free. And uh, it comes with most of the client SDKs, I think. Um, so you know, Go, Rust, all of those, they're all, um, they all support the microservices structure out of the box. So, Let's see if I can do a demo here. Looks pretty good. Um, is is that legible? Is, that's legible? Is that good? Legible? All right, cool. So the first thing I want to do is I'm going to start a next node. And really? So I'm going to start a next node. And a next node is, like I said, just a single process. And as long as I have a connection to NATS, I can start it. So whether I'm running this in the cloud to host cloud-based workloads or whether I'm running it on a Raspberry Pi to run edge-based workloads, it's all still the same stuff. So that's it. Um, my, I now essentially have uh, an empty host that I can use to deploy workloads into. And so. Uh, I have this uh, command called workload run where I give it the name of the workload and I tell it where I want the workload to run. And in this case, the, the node ID should look sort of familiar if, you're, if you've uh, been operating NATs for a while. Uh, this is just a, a node key for uh, next. Um, if you start more than one next node, they automatically form a, uh, a cluster of nodes. And uh, you can stitch together your compute infrastructure the same way you can your NATS messaging infrastructure. Um, another interesting thing about this is that what I'm going to run is actually in the uh, GitHub um, artifact registry. We'll see if the hotel wire, all right, Wi-Fi seems to have worked. So um, I've just got a little log message here that says I've spawned a process. So whatever binary was sitting inside that image is now running. And I can get a list of the next nodes that are running. Really? I mean, there you go. Come on. Got me a break here. OK, so this is the list of nodes that are running. The important thing to note here is that it's got one workload running. And if I check the info on this one node, you'll see that I have counter running as a, as a workload and when I started it. And 
uh, you'll also see that I have a microservice running. The microservice is running because it's inside the workload that I just deployed. So, you know, I can do Matt's micro info. And so now here are the endpoints on my, come on. It'll come back. All right. It's all just one big conspiracy against me. So I have two endpoints, count and stepper. Basically the workload that I deployed is just constantly counting up. Not all that useful a functionality, but at least it, it, what it does show is it gives me a way to show you that I have a workload that's running in the background doing a long running process. So it's counted up to 101. Uh, now it's up to 103. Pretty soon we'll have our own blockchain. And I can change the amount that it steps up by by doing So now it's counting up by two. I should be able to sell this to a VC for a couple million easy. And one other thing I wanted to show is inside that same workload, I have a web server that's running, that's showing me the counter and the current value of stepper. So I can drop it down and, you know, so essentially I've got my my fully running, fully functional, highly profitable web application all deployed on NATS. And you know, if I see that I've got you know, too many customers to handle, which is pretty obvious from this app, if I've got too many customers to handle, then I can just go back into the next command line and add more instances of it. And if I want to add another instance to US East, US West, three different clouds, it doesn't matter. So I can essentially, because I'm sitting on top of NATS, I can deploy my compute to uh, any cloud I want to, uh, including on-prem, uh, uh, out at you know, remote devices, um, IoT devices in the field, fleets, all of that stuff is now just easily deployable because I've built NATS on top of NATS. All right, so let's see if I can find my way back to the slides. Make sure I'm getting the wiggle in. So there's a couple of different ways that you can use Next. The, uh, the one that I just showed was I've just got an application and I'm going to use Next to deploy it. You can also use Next as your own platform. Everything that I do to remotely control workloads is available as a client SDK. So I can write code that starts workloads uh, automatically. And so we've got a, an application called Poker, or All In Nets Poker. And it is a uh, suite of microservices. Uh, and there's a, a Go binary for the web server. And what's interesting here is that uh, as load grows and more customers come to play yet another highly profitable game, we can take, we can use Next to dynamically start more poker tables. So each poker table is essentially one long running service that's playing out the, the, the game state in memory. And, uh, for the, the gamers here, this is essentially the lobby and shard pattern. But again, everything, is, is, everything here is NATS based. Uh, all of the persisted data is stored in key value stores. Um, all of the messaging is done over NATS and all of the streams, again, uh, just Jetstream. So we, we have a user service, a bank service, lobby service, the web application itself, uh, which is currently publicly deployed. And um, when we need more poker tables, we can just spin them up with an X command. So this is roughly what this architecture looks like. So we have our uh, cluster of next nodes as the game maintainers. And so this has all of our services in it, including a tables service which is responsible for 
spawning uh, individual workloads that are ma that manage uh, poker tables. So let's see if I can find poker here. All right, so this is, yeah, I can't really, can I, can I make that bigger? Yes, I can, okay. So uh, in order to keep our costs down, I'm not, I removed uh, buttons that would make it so that you could just dynamically spawn an infinite number of poker tables. But there's one poker table that's currently running and if I go look at that table, uh, again, this is the administrator view, so um, I don't have to, I'm not looking at you know, what the end user would see. You can see how um, inside this process, there's a number of different players, and you know, we're maintaining their stack, whatever that is. Obviously, I'm a champion poker player. Um, and you know, however much money they have, and you know, we're we're dealing cards and and so on. So it's essentially ru running its own poker game inside that table. And you know, when this table fills up, and you know, we reach the maximum number of players of nine, we could write code that just sees that event and creates a new table. And then uh, when that game is done, or when enough players leave, we can just shut down the, the table process. And so obviously the, the goal here isn't to teach everybody how to make a poker game. The goal is that Nex is not only a vehicle for you to deploy your own applications wherever you want to deploy them, but it can also be used as a platform to build applications that use the dynamic workload scheduling as a feature for your own app. Thank you, Kevin. Yep. So now that the fun stuff is over. <laughs> Back to me. All right, so just to kind of wrap this up, um, bringing it all together, so <clears throat> going back to the first handful of slides and making that claim that rethinking application design, building upon connectivity at, at the bottom, and then building primitives on top. <clears throat> and next is sort of the, the, the next iteration of this, introducing workloads. So again, Nats has connectivity, the messaging, the clustering, you know, arbitrary topologies. With the data side, we have streams, they're persistent. We have KV abstractions, object store abstractions on top. And now we are going into the workload uh, part of the stack. And now you can build full-blown nothing but Nats applications, um, basically with Nats and Nex together. And I think an important thing there is that um, the next nodes, as Kevin said, they can cluster, they can kind of ind independently scale. Um, if you only need a smaller NATS cluster, you can have many, many more NATS next nodes if you, if you need to. So yeah. that's why it's sort of a deliberate decision to sort of uh, separate those two things. Yeah, on that point too, I think it's important to mention that, and I, I kind of alluded to it, is that the next nodes don't need to be in the exact same physical location as a NAT server. All they need is connectivity to a NAT server. So, you know, one of the really fun architectures that I've been playing with is, you know, a, a physical device that's managed by a Raspberry Pi. There's a leaf node on the Raspberry Pi, and there's two or three next nodes inside that device talking to the leaf node, and the leaf node talks back to uh, Synity Cloud. So, um, again, you're only limited by your imagination and, um, well, I guess money, right? Your imagination, yeah. Well, here's a couple, here's a couple of real world imagined things. Um, these are just, you know, rough diagrams from some of our, um, some of the customers at Synadia. Um, obviously, no disclosure of, of names or anything like that, but these are actually real architecture diagrams, um, you know, at a very high level, but the point is, and this is, goes back to beyond cloud native. So cloud services, cloud providers, they're great. They're differentiated, use them, leverage them. But take a step back and say, should I be completely all in on one cloud provider or do I need to you know, go across clouds? Do I, are there multi-region um, sufficient services out there? And we found with our customers who are, you know, some of which are very large scale, lovely, wiggle, wiggle. 
Um, you can get some, into some really interesting into, into some really interesting architectures, and you know, in this particular one, we have a, 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 a customer that has to go across all three major cloud providers for regulatory reasons and have data shared in all, all three cloud providers, and then they also have their own physical data center, so they can cluster a bunch of NAT servers together as a, it forms a super cluster, and then they can be able to store the data locally as they need to in those respective areas. And then introducing Next, being able to, again, it's not, not released yet, but you know, logically you can think of, now I can actually deploy workloads right alongside and I don't have to introduce all this additional uh, infrastructure uh, and, and other you know, compute abstractions. Here's another one that's more of a retail site device edge. Um, this is more of like a retail store type of model. Um, same, same basic pattern, it's just a different topology, it's a different you know, flow of things, but it's the same, it's beyond, just beyond the cloud, like you need to be in a point of sale system. Um, Nats can sit there too, and we have customers doing that. Sorry. And then finally, you know, all, all the rage, AI at the edge. We have customers building AI at the edge, uh, whole companies based on Nats. Sorry. It's, it's really the productivity fin monitor. Really making finicky sure we're today. doing work. Yeah. So, you know, between data collection at the edge, you move that data all the way up into the cloud where you have very beefy machines and you can do the training, you can do all that stuff, you, you know, create the model, you can push down the model down to a local object store at the edge and do local inferencing and use a workload there and a service running. So we have people today doing that and, and it's all off the back of NATS. So it's sort of just to show like, you know, what the power of this combination actually is. And you know, this is a quick, these slides will be up on the um, sketch.com, so you know, I know I'm rushing through a couple of these things. Um, but you can kind of see the layers that we have that are all stacked and just, even though we have our, our Senadia logo, this is all open source. Snats and Next are open source, just to be clear, okay? All right, we have a few minutes for questions, but here's some resources and um, that's the feedback QR code if you have any. Uh, we probably have time for maybe one one question, and then I'm going to ask one question to see if we can give away this uh, jacket. And then, if we're anyone who uh, has questions afterwards, you can come up to Kevin and I. Yes. Hi, uh, my question is regarding uh, the actual infrastructure, because uh, the way I understood the NATS is basically kind of a sidecar, meaning I have a uh, node, and then I have a cycle of NAS that where my applications talk to the NAT and it distributes how it's supposed to be distributed. But then, how will I orchestrate the, 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 the actual physical nodes or the actual physical uh, stuff? Like, what kind of solution do you suggest? Yeah, no, great, great question. So, NATs um, doesn't need, um, it's kind of two, se two separate parts there. So. You have a, a NAT cert, like a single NAT server. You have your client um, application that uses one of the NATS SDKs. You can just build your application using the NATS SDK. That application connects directly into NATS. It could be a single server, a whole cluster, a whole super cluster, whatever, it doesn't matter. And then all of the messaging happens just over that. It, it's not a traditional sidecar like you would have like a Envoy proxy in an Istio context or something like that. that there's actually no need for that. Um, and then similarly, as Kevin said, with the next side, that itself, that, that node is also connected into NATS, and that's how it can, over the, kind of the control, the management plane, it can, you can schedule the workload on that next node that's actually connected in. So if that's, if that's helpful. So you, you really can have like bare hardware, you, you spin up a NAT server, you spin up a next node, they can be you know, on separate places, separate hardware, and as long as they're connect, connected in, um, then everything kind of just works. You know, typically when, if, if you're deciding to run NATs physically close to an application, um, it's not because you're being forced into a sidecar model, it's usually something where you need to localize traffic or you're trying to optimize latency between two applications, that sort of thing. Cool, just mindful of time. Again, if you have any more questions, you can come up to us afterwards, so. Get to the good stuff. Get to the good stuff. So you can keep it, you can auction it, you can do whatever you want, whoever gets it. Um, this is one of our colleagues, David G. If you saw him walking around the conference floor, um, 
he actually made this. So We should have made people try and crash poker, and whoever crashed yeah. poker got the shirt. <laughs> so question, let's see if anyone gets this. What was, uh, what was the programming language that NAS was originally written in? Go. So you said Go? Ruby. It was originally written in Ruby. Nice job. It came out of Cloud Foundry, and Cloud Foundry was written in Ruby, and then it was rewritten in Go a couple of years later. Congratulations. Thank you so much. <laughs> wear it with pride. Yes, wear it with pride. At least take a picture, tweet it out. That'll be fun. All right. Thanks, everyone. Um, and again, we'll be around for a few minutes. We can chat, but thanks so much for your time. Thanks.